My name is Dane Salter. I'm the Young Adults and Men's Minister here. And I'm just really grateful to be here with you this morning. Y'all are the few, you're the proud, you're the elite who have remained in Texas, either because you didn't have a choice or because, hey, you really just love the heat. Either way, we're grateful that you are here this morning. Last week, we kicked off a new series entitled The Shape of Desperate Dependence. And we use that because if, if you're new to us, then you may not know our mission, the reason we exist as Northwest Bible Church is to invite others into the unexpected joy of desperate dependence on Jesus, which I love. That sounds so good, right? Looks good on a t-shirt. It's a great catchy slogan. It's excellent marketing. But what does that actually mean, right? What does it actually look like to be desperately dependent on Jesus? Well, that's what this series is all about, is taking a look at various different aspects and situations in our lives and saying, what does it look like, Lord, to be desperately dependent on you? So last week, blast from the past, Brian Newby came, kicked off the series, and talked about the shape of desperate dependence in seasons of doubt. And this morning, we're gonna camp out in those same feelings and talk about what it looks like to be desperately dependent on God in seasons of chaos. My hope this morning is that your faith will be emboldened and your spirit will be encouraged this morning. So let me pray and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. God, I thank you for the privilege and the honor of being here on the stage this morning. Holy Spirit, fill me. I know that my preparation, my words, they mean nothing apart from you. So I pray that you would be the air in my lungs, that it would be your truth that is heard here this morning, not my ideas. God, I pray that we fall more in love with you this morning and we leave with a more solid assurance that you are with us in every circumstance. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, it's safe to say that the year 2020 was rough, to say the least, right? But it's also kind of funny for my wife and I because it taught us a very important lesson about our place in the Dallas ecosphere. See, it all started back in March as we went to go visit her family in Louisiana. We're both from Louisiana originally, her from Alexandria, me from Shreveport. If you've ever been to or seen either, that may explain a thing or two about us. But we got to my in-law's house late at night and it was very different from our normal greeting. Normally they rush out to greet us in the carport and there's lots of hugging and lots of loud haze from my mother-in-law. It's very sweet, very hallmark, it's precious. But not this time. This time we rolled in late at night and there was no big greeting. We went into the, into the house, into the kitchen and her mom came and said, hey, it's so good to see you guys, but have y'all heard the news? Well, no, we've, we've been on the road for the last five, six hours. What's, what's going on? And she said, you need to come see this. And so she took us into the living room where my father-in-law was glued to the TV. And on the screen was the governor of Louisiana declaring a state of emergency and a mandatory quarantine for the state of Louisiana. And we couldn't believe it. This, this didn't seem real. And that next morning, I got a call from my boss here at the church saying, hey, there's a mandatory staff meeting where it was announced that Northwest Bible Church would be closing its doors and shutting down all on-campus activity by state mandate. And y'all, it just felt unreal. I remember leaving early from that trip to, to go to the grocery store to get some supplies and things to hunker down, right? Should have grabbed more toilet paper. If only I'd known, right, what precious gold that was gonna become, but it's neither here nor there. Next time, hopefully there's not one. But I do remember how quiet it was in the aisles and how empty the shelves were. And I remember the, the look of nervous agitation in everybody's eyes as we walked around that grocery store. And the next couple months were, were really difficult for everyone, obviously, but there was a, a unique twist for people who were in ministry 
Because not only were we trying to take care of our family and our needs, we're also trying to figure out how to care for the body, the people God has entrusted us to serve and love. How am I supposed to preach encouragement when it feels like the world is just burning down around us? Well, a couple months later, we found ourselves back in Louisiana, this time visiting my parents. We walked into an eerily familiar scene. There they were, glued to the TV, except on the screen this time was not the governor declaring a mandate, but was actually footage of riots happening in downtown Dallas, just a mile from where we lived. And I remember thinking, this is insane. This is chaos. There's no way this is possible. It also taught us a very important lesson. We learned that, hey, apparently Casey and I are somehow strategically invaluable to the stability of the city of Dallas because every time we left, something crazy happened. Whether it was a pandemic or a quarantine or no toilet paper, that tornado that happened in 2019, we were out of town for that too, y'all. We're sorry, okay, from the bottom of our heart, we did not mean to cause so much stress and anxiety. All jokes aside, it's no secret that we live in a chaotic world. If it's not a pandemic, then it's an economic crisis. If it's not the economy, it's a war. If it's not a war, it's some kind of natural disaster, a tornado, a flood, hurricane, fire, maybe all of them all at once. Sometimes the chaos we experience isn't some external thing out there in the world, but it's an internal chaos that we feel. Maybe we experience it in the death of a loved one, or maybe the loss of a relationship or a friendship. Maybe the loss of trust in a relationship or a friendship. Maybe we lost our job and our sense of financial stability and security. Maybe your kids are in a really hard season of parenting right now. Maybe you're a kid and you're saying, no, my parents are not creating the kind of loving, committed, stable environment that I crave. We live in a world of chaos. And if you're feeling anxious this morning, if you feel overwhelmed or depressed or hopeless, if your life or the world around you seems like it's falling apart, I want you to hear me. God wants to bring you peace this morning. Even if you don't feel that way today, hey, that's awesome, great, praise God. Watch the news for about five minutes, you'll be there with the rest of us. The book of Ecclesiastes says that life is cyclical, right? So, see, so there are gonna be seasons of chaos coming one day. And I pray that when they do, you'll remember the truth that we're gonna talk about this morning from the book of Psalms. That you'll remember the shape of desperate dependence, what it looks like to lean on Jesus when life is dominated by chaos. Turn with me this morning to the book of Psalm 46. Psalm 46, we're going to see three actions that we are to take in the midst of our chaos. And as you turn there, I want to talk about this series a little bit. I love that the shape of desperate dependence, this series, is focused on the book of Psalms. Because there's something about music, about art, about poetry that speaks to our internal dialogues, our internal thoughts in a way that people can relate to and say, hey, I, I've experienced that. The book of Psalms paints the emotions of the people of God throughout various different seasons. And it does it in a way that we can relate to, in a way that we can say, hey, I may have not been in that exact situation, but I felt that. I know what that feels like. Although the particular circumstances that surround Psalm 46 are not totally known, the majority of scholars agree that it was most likely written during the reign of King Hezekiah and that it's coming from the people in the city of Jerusalem. At that time, the great enemy of God's people was the people of Assyria. For context, Nineveh, right? Story of Jonah. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. They were like the poster child for what it looks like to be an Assyrian. And if you've ever read Jonah, you know about the people of Nineveh, you know what they were like. Fish slappers, am I right? 
That's a VeggieTales reference. For those of you who have kids, you're welcome. I grew up in the 90s. Yes, I did. In reality, they were a bit more cruel than that. In fact, it wasn't uncommon for them to take victims and hang them on the walls of their city as a message to all outsiders. In fact, they were known to actually flay their enemies, that would be God's people, Israel, to literally peel their skin off and put it on the wall as a sign to the people they didn't like. Come in here and this is what you get. These are the people. And during Hezekiah's reign, the Assyrians, these people, came and laid siege to the city of Jerusalem. Sieges were a really common warfare tactic at that time. Basically, what you would do is you would surround the entire city, cutting it off completely from the outside world. That means no food coming in, no water, no supplies, no help, no escape, just you surrounded by the enemy until you give up. Now, I'm sure that your home has never been laid siege to in this way, although parents, you may have felt that way this summer with all your kids home, I feel for you. But I bet that you have had situations and seasons where you have felt that kind of panic, a time when you felt completely isolated, when you have felt cut off, surrounded on all sides by chaos with no relief in view. That is the emotional place that Psalm 46 starts this morning. And what I love about this Psalm is that it doesn't start from a place of fear, but it actually wades in from a place of strength. Read with me in verse one, Psalm 46, one. God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble. God is our refuge and strength. This verse is the main theme throughout this psalm, and it brings us to the first action we are to take. The first thing we do in a time of crisis is seek. Seek God's presence in the chaos. Now, I know often when we hear things like this, hey, you need to seek God, we think ask. Right? We think, hey, I need to call out to God and ask him to come get into my circumstances, to come be with me in the well. Like he's our next door neighbor, we need to go knock on the door and say, hey, come and help me. But that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, what this psalm is talking about, is the reality that God is already present in our circumstances. He is our refuge and strength. The word refuge is meant to paint this picture of like huddling under an overhang during a storm. The idea is that when the world is crashing down around you, God provides protection, stability, peace. Even during the chaos that we face, he is still providing protection and peace. We may experience chaos, but the fact that our entire lives are not crashing down in every possible way and every day is evidence of God's grace and mercy in our lives. The idea of refuge is used three different times throughout these 11 verses because the psalmist wants us to be certain God is with us. Not only that, he is with his people and He wants to help us in times of trouble. The ESV translates this Hebrew word as he's a very present help, others as always ready to help. The idea is that God is eager to help us. That he's already sheltering us from so much more than we possibly realize. And he still wants to help us in our present circumstances. Now, he doesn't force himself on us. He still lets us choose him. He lets us take time to try and work it out on our own if we want. But when we humble ourselves and we say, God, I, I, I do need you. Show me where you are in the middle of this. That he does what only he does best and rushes in to reestablish peace and hope. Which means for us, we don't have to be afraid. Verse two, It says, therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, 
and the mountains tremble at its swelling. The psalmist is using creation to describe spiritual forces of chaos in our world. Earthquakes were really common in the area surrounding Jerusalem. Now today we know what an earthquake is, right? We know, thanks to science, that as the earth's plates shift, as they move together or they pull apart, it literally causes the earth to shake. We get that. Thank you, science. Fifth grade science class coming in handy. But I don't know if you've ever been in an earthquake before, if you've ever experienced that reality. My bet is that if you have, the intellectual knowledge of what was happening was not much comfort to the fact that the earth is literally shaking beneath your feet. That the one thing you're supposed to be able to count on to be stable and constant is ripping itself apart, it feels like. We live in a world where creation itself can bring chaos, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, wildfires, all of these things. Sometimes it feels like the earth itself is literally trying to rip itself apart and we're all just collateral damage. So if we can't trust the ground beneath our feet to be stable, where do we look? for consistency? Where do we look for security? Psalm 46 says it's in God because he is the creator, because God is the one who brings order into our chaos. Commentator Don Williams described God's, God's creation as a great natural drama that seethes with the unexpected but will reach ultimate culmination in Jesus. We don't have to be afraid in our chaos. In fact, we can actually be courageous because we know God is with us. Rather than fearing, we can actually use that chaos as an opportunity to lean in to God and to bring hope to the people who are in the chaos with us, to have surprisingly easy to start conversations about Jesus. We don't have to fear the chaos because God is present with us and because God is more powerful than our chaos. When chaos descends, first we seek God's presence. Then we trust. Trust in God's power over chaos. Our second action is to trust in God's power over our chaos. Starting in verse four, the psalmist starts to paint this picture of God's presence bringing stability and security. It says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. Tim Keller, during 2020, talking about this very psalm, said this is describing a picture of God's Holy Spirit as the stream that sustains his people. Where God is, hope and help are also. The psalmist describes a river making glad the city of God. Historically, it was much harder to lay siege to a city if it had a river or a stream running through it. It was a fresh source of water. If there were fish in it, they could fish and have food. It had these sustaining properties, which meant they could last a lot longer. Jerusalem, at this time, was the holy city because it had the temple, the place where priests would make sacrifices for the people of God on behalf of their sin. Once a year, the high priest would go into the innermost part of the temple, the Holy of Holies, called that because it is where heaven and earth literally met, where the presence of God dwelled. And once a year, the high priest would go in and sacrifice for all the sins of the people of Israel for that year. Today, we don't have to go to Jerusalem to make sacrifices. Aren't you thankful? Can you imagine the plane tickets? But if you've placed your faith in Jesus, the very presence of God is not out there for us to go find and search for. It's in you. If you have placed your faith in Jesus, God's Holy Spirit is with you, indwelling you, sustaining you, cultivating your heart to look more like 
God's connecting you intimately to God. We can remain rooted as chaos comes up in our lives because God is present with us and because God is more powerful than our chaos. He's flowing through us, bringing life, and God's presence brings God's peace. Verse five goes on to say, God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob, the eternal God, is our fortress. God isn't just with us in the chaos. He is the solution to the chaos that plagues our lives. I love the second part of verse five here. God will help her when morning dawns. It reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite movies, uh, Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight. Yes, Batman on a Sunday morning. Here we go, y'all. Let's just all accept that that's what's happening right now. In the movie, the city of Gotham is being plagued by a self-proclaimed agent of chaos, the Joker, right? And they're in fear, there's turmoil, there's panic, no one knows what's going on. And Gotham's white knight, Harvey Dent, holds a press conference to say, hey, I wanna give you hope, I wanna give you encouragement, how are we gonna get through this time? And he says, the night is darkest just before the dawn, but I promise you, dawn is coming. Just gives you chills, doesn't it? You didn't know he's quoting Psalms, but he might be, who knows? But sometimes, life gets pretty bad. And just when we think there's no possible way that it could get any worse, somehow it does. And in those moments, it's easy to be tempted to think, hey, God, he's just, he's abandoned us. Or at least he's abandoned me. Maybe he's working in, in y'all's lives, but he forgot about me. Psalm 46 says, no, God comes when you least expect it. When all hope seems, lo seems lost, when the night is at its darkest, he bursts in with light and with hope. Verse six describes the magnitude of God's power that he brings to rescue us. It talks about the nations raging and kingdoms tottering. The psalmist is describing how we as people fight our entire lives for power so that we can try and control the chaos in our lives. We work really hard, we get amazing jobs, we do whatever it takes to succeed so that we can have some semblance of control so that we can deal with some of this craziness in our lives. But God, he merely speaks and the earth melts. He speaks with a word and creation responds because he is the creator. And because he's the creator, he is the authority the name above all other names. He's the ultimate power. And what does he do with that power? He doesn't use it to control us or to oppress us. No, he uses that power to protect his people, his family. He is our fortress. God's presence brings God's power. Your chaos does not stand a chance against God. Trust in his power over the chaos in your life. Now, I know at this point, some of you are probably thinking, Dane, this is all really well and good. I hear this message about God's presence, bringing God's power, and like, that sounds really cool and all, but if I'm honest, I've been asking for God's presence. I've been seeking him in my chaos. I've been begging him to do something. And the chaos is still here. And if I'm honest, it's just getting worse. Well, if that's you this morning, I want you to know that God sees you. God sees you this morning. He sees what's happening in your life. He hasn't abandoned you, he hasn't misplaced you. You're not like some set of cosmic keys that he's looking for. Where did I put them? No, he, he sees you. Seek him in your chaos. Trust his power over chaos. And when it seems like 
things are only getting darker, remember. Our third action this morning, remember God's promises during the chaos. Verse eight says, come and behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. God's presence brings God's power. And God's power, it brings God's peace. The psalmist is encouraging us to remember that when chaos abounds and it seems like all hope is lost, remember the promises of God. Remember who he claims to be. Remember what he's done in the past. Remember what he's promised to do in the future. Throughout the Bible, again and again, we see God bringing order into chaos. Starting all the way back in Genesis, we see how God sets the stage for bringing hope from despair, life from death. In Genesis, the universe is pictured as being formless and void, empty. And then it talks about the earth and its foundation being just like raging water. This isn't meant to be like an apologetic argument for how can there be water if it's formless and void and empty? How do those things go together? No, it's, it's a picture, it's an illustration that the people of the time would have understood because for them in that time, the ocean, the sea, was the most perfect image of chaos that they had. They saw those waves ebbing and flowing. They saw storms come out of nowhere and literally rip fishing vessels apart. The sea was not to be trusted. It was the definition of uncertainty, of doubt, of emptiness, of destruction, of chaos. And yet what does God do in that chaos? He speaks. Let there be light. Let there be hope. Let there be life. And he builds a universe out of that chaos. He harnesses it into creation to build a universe that is primed to sustain life and to help it flourish. That is the kind of God that we have with us in our chaos. He uses that power and that power brings order, structure, and life. The disciples see this again in the New Testament. They're sailing from one bank to the other. Jesus is taking a nap below deck and a storm comes in on the sea and their whole world just like falls apart. They think we're about to die, this place is going down. That's it. And they cry out to Jesus who comes up and with a word to stop, he exerts his power and peace is restored. The chaos ends and order is ushered in. And he's not done yet. A day is coming when Jesus himself will put a final end to the chaos we experience in our world. We don't just worship a God who, who was alive back then and who was really active and did things back then. We worship a God who is alive and active today in your circumstances right now. A God who gives us hope and a promise for a future, to wipe every tear from our eye, that he will never abandon us. Jesus promises a day is coming when he shall return, and when he does, it will be to put an end to the chaos once and for all, to reestablish order, to help everything, everything in this universe and all of creation be restored to the way it was always meant to be in perfect harmony with God and with each other. This picture of harmony that the Old Testament calls shalom. That Jesus is coming to usher in a world of harmony, of everything as it was always meant to be. What do we do until then? 
we follow God's own instructions in verse 10. In verse 10, God himself interjects his response to the psalmist and to his people. And this is what he says. God says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, this is a verse that we say so often as Christians that it's kind of become Christian cliche, right? How are you handling the chaos in your life? I'm just being still and letting God be God, you know, be still. We have it sewn on pillows, it hangs on our walls. We love this verse, but don't miss how truly countercultural this idea of being still before God is. The word still is the same Hebrew word that's used to describe the nation's raging. God is quite literally saying, hey, just, just stop. Stop striving. Stop trying to control everything. Stop trying to do for me. Stop trying to prove to me that you're worthy. Stop trying to do all these things to manage the chaos in your life. Just stop. Just be with me. Just rest with me. Let me be God. Let me handle the chaos. Church, there is no chaos, either in creation or in humanity or in your life, that God can't bring peace to. We have that same kind of peace if we take time to sit still and remember that God is in control. And if we remember his promises, promises that you're not alone, that he hasn't forgotten about you, that he sees you, that he loves you, that he is powerful and mighty to save, that he'll never abandon you, and that he can actually use all things for our good. And one day he will. So as the band comes back up, I wanna close with this. I admit, I don't know your story. I don't know what you walked in here with. I don't know what anxieties and worries are plaguing your heart this morning. And I don't want you to walk out of here thinking that what I'm saying today is is easy or that the things you're experiencing in your circumstances is trivial and light. That's not my heart at all. I don't know your story, but God does. And he desperately wants you to know that you're not alone. He sees you. He's with you. And he's given you us. And he's actually given us you. Don't let us miss out on the joy, the privilege of getting to walk through this season with you. One of the best things you can do during a time of chaos is is get with some believers, join a small group, go to some people who you trust and do life with them. Let them get to hear your story and help them help you make sense of the chapter that God has you in right now. God wants to bring order and peace to the chaos, but he never does that in secret. God always does his best work in the light. The best way to seek God's peace, to have his peace in the middle of the chaos is to just be still, like he said. To take time to pause and reflect on the fact that he is still God, that he is still in control, that he knows what he's doing. And it may feel like chaos inside of us, but he has a plan. So this week, I want you to set a reminder, an alarm, a task, whatever, to take 60 seconds of silence every day this week. It can be in the morning, it can be at lunch, it can be in the afternoon, when you get home, whatever works best for you. But take 60 seconds to just sit and be with God. Not to pray or to think about your list of the ways you're gonna tackle the day and figure things out, but to just remind yourself that all God really asks from us is that we know Him that we sit and be still with him. And I understand that, hey, this is a little uncomfortable for some of you, this is is different. 
It can feel kind of weird, and that's all right. The point of this is to remind ourselves that God doesn't actually need us to bring his peace. So often we get caught up in what we're trying to do to help usher in God's peace, how we can do all the efforts to just make things happen. And if we're honest, we only end up adding to the chaos and overexerting ourselves. When all God wants is for us to just be still, to just sit and rest and let God be God. Let him tend to your wounds and whisper his promises of love to you. 60 seconds of silence, that's all I'm asking for. And if this is weird and you need something to help focus your mind during that time, you can just repeat the phrase, God, you are with me. God, you are with me. I actually wanna invite us to practice this this morning. So if you wanna take the kneelers out that are in front of you, and if you're able to go ahead and, and take a knee on those kneelers, we're gonna go into a time of just 60 seconds of silence before God, saying, God, you are with me. God, you are with me. We live in a world of chaos, but we are not alone. We are not alone. God is our refuge. And so we seek his presence in the chaos. Not only that, we trust that he is powerful and mighty to save and that he wants to. So we trust his power over our chaos. And when things are at their darkest, we don't despair, but we remember. We remember the promises of God during our chaos, trusting that he is faithful and mighty to accomplish those promises. And we don't have to fear because God is our refuge. The Lord of hosts is with us. And all he asks is that we be still and let him be God.